say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. This we will do if God permits. So we would till the garden, I mean, every spring. And by the way, if you want to find the smart people in the room, you got to find the lazy people. Because the people who work, what do they do? We just there's a job, we just get it done. The lazy people actually sit there and contemplate. What's the easiest way to get around it? And I was that kid for a little bit in life and um, until it didn't work out so well because in the garden were weeds. And by the way, weeds, they, they're, uh, they miraculously grow overnight. No matter how many of them you pluck out of the ground, there will be new ones the next day. The, the weeding process never ends. If you want a garden... You need to know you have to weed for eternity. Um, That's not the word I was looking for, but that works. The uh, Because that's what it feels like. And so in our garden, I came up with the idea of, well, if you till the ground, if you, if you till the weeds into the soil and then hard rake it over, it looks awesome. All the weeds are still in the soil. In my seven-year-old mind, I thought it would kill the weeds by uprooting them. No, but what it does actually is it replants the weeds. And actually, the next day after the rain, they actually are healthier than before. Unbelievable. That was the last of that. Mom wasn't happy. I, I got all, the, all my brothers on board to do this. It cut the time down in a third. But either way, we had to reweed. Um, so maybe laziness isn't the way to go in the end. Uh, but the garden, right? So what motivates you to till the garden? Well, it's what's going to be produced, Lord willing, in the end. It's looking ahead. It's seeing the harvest. It's knowing, in, in our sense, we're almost home. It's keeping our hope alive. It's, it's setting our sights on what's to come. But there's some work that has to happen. But see, the problem is you're not the gardener. You're the garden. You're the soil. See, don't forget this as we go over the next couple of weeks, three weeks, because when you believe you're the gardener, well, fear is going to set in when we hit next week and we start reading about regressing almost out of salvation. Fear is going to set in, but this isn't a you. I mean, I mean, we end right there at, on verse 3. If God permits, we will do this. Not to talk about all the other uh, references in John about the vine dresser coming into your life and pruning off the dead, the dead branches that aren't producing and burning them on the side so there's room for new growth. You are the garden. This is what my garden felt like, yet it was probably about the size of three rows. I just It feels endless. When God's at work in you and, and it's just ongoing, it feels endless. And the question is, is it ever going to end? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. But every time the garden, the soil of, of your life is tilled up and is broken, the Lord is making room for new growth. Christ in you. He's alive in you. It's a new life. It's a life that you've got to come to know by the knowledge of God. You've got to come to realize that he's at work, not, not just making you right now like new. He's, he's replacing you. Flesh and bone is out of here one day, soon to be reunited with a life that will never fail. But what's moving this life, this new life, is literally the life, the spirit of Jesus Christ himself. And you are being transformed and conformed into his likeness every day. The garden, the soil has to be. You rush to the harvest, you try to get there too quick, you're going to kill it. It's going to, it's going to be malnourished. It's not going to. But about this, we have a lot to say. You see, Jesus Christ is the high priest. 
He's done the work. He has bridged the gap between you, the, uh, the one who was unrighteous, but now is the righteousness of Christ because of what he's done. He's bridged the gap between you and living with the Father forever. He's built the home. fascinating. I read it in Luke this week, uh, and I'm going off memory, so pardon the paraphrase, but the chief high priest right before they crucify the Son of God and hang him on a cross, uh, there was an accusation laid, an, an attempt to prove that Jesus was a false teacher or whatnot, or that he was coming to destroy Jerusalem, and so on. said, well, we heard him say he's going to destroy this temple in three days and build another one out of something that wasn't human hands, and the chief priest goes, are you kidding me? Is this correct? And he says, yeah. Jesus says, yeah. You will see one day. You will see it one day. And I sat there and I read that verse over and over and over again. That, that, that high priest will come to see what Jesus was talking about. That he was going to build a new kingdom, not out of human hands, but out of the hands of his father. And John 14 says that kingdom lies right there in his home. His home is inside of you. He lives in you. His kingdom is here. It's invaded earth. And guys, it's right amongst us. And one day, the veil will be torn off and you will realize you are home. Pain and death, gone forever. About this, you have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. Now, okay, personalize this if you want. It's, we're just casting it out there. Some of you, this message will sit heavy. Others of you will feel like it doesn't apply. And some of you, it won't make sense because you're dull of hearing sluggish in here, lazy in here. We, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's not an accusation. It's an explanation, okay? Because you can read something like this and feel as if you're being accused. And I'll try to remind you as much as I can, this is not an accusation. It's an explanation for why some of you feel as if you just are not close to God. There's just this, this feeling inside that, I wish I knew God like so-and-so, or that person seems to be steady in all trials of life. That person seems to have joy regardless of the fact that they're bound to a weird wheelchair. You know, that person, you know, is dying of cancer, and look at the smile on their face, and they still have time to love me. I want that. I want that. And you just have this feeling. I can't pull it out of you. I can't make you have this feeling. You just feel as if you've regressed. You want more. You can't get there. Well, the, the possibility is you've become dull in your hearing. This what we've already talked just previous before this, that you are being taught to obey Christ. That word obedience can really mess you up, but at its core, it means you're being taught on how to listen attentively and respond to Christ in course, then you're going to do what Christ wants, which will be what you want. It'll be your new desires. But this idea of obedience is, is a, a heart and a mind that is open and receptive to the words of God and to Christ speaking to us and us responding instinctively. But if you become dull of hearing, you're not going to hear Christ. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, this is kind of a review from a couple weeks ago, but it bleeds really well in the Hebrews chapter 6. By this time you ought to be teachers. I mean, you guys all are part of a circle of influence. Right? I mean, if you're a parent, you've got kids. If you're, if you're a co-worker, you've got a boss or you've got employees. Uh, if you're at school, you've got, uh, you know, you've got classmates. and you got you're, there's, there's circles of influence everywhere we go. We're all teachers. And uh, we ought to be teachers by now, as he's saying. You ought to be a teacher by now, but you need someone to teach you. You ought to be teaching geometry, but you still don't know one plus two. And so don't go out there and teach geometry if you haven't learned the basic principles of math. Or maybe you've learned them and you haven't practiced them, so you've forgotten them. So it would be actually uh, counterproductive to go and try to teach someone you know, algebra if you've forgotten math in of itself, and it could let you off the hook if you feel as if you need to go and evangelize. But get yourself in a place where you know the basic principles of God first, and then you can begin to work them out day in and day out. But there's something that is 
for the dull of hearing, there's something that begins to swamp you, that begins to distract you, that prevents you from growing. Remember, not an accusation, an explanation. Okay, But oftentimes in our explanations, we become aware of the forces that work around us that are distracting us and, and starving us from what we need ultimately. You need someone to teach you again what the basic principles of the oracles of God. You just need to learn how does God speak? Where does God speak? The utterances of God, the basic utterances of God. You need to learn the very basics of what God has already said. And if you can get that foundation laid, then you have something to work off of. You've got something to begin to filter things off of. But without that, you have no filter. You, what, what's right, what's wrong, what's righteousness, what's not, and there, there's no filter. Now, give me a few minutes, and we're going to bump into some stuff that's going to be very, hopefully, interesting and eye-opening to you, and, and Lord willing, in a way that's going to actually cause you to make some decisions in your life of some very practical decisions. Uh, for everyone, verse 13, who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. You're just not there yet. You're just, God hasn't permitted you to be there yet. Remember, he's the gardener. We're not, there's not an accusation. It's an explanation. But also what he's driving at is learning is not living. There comes a point where we move on from the learning. We get back to the living. But we have to. To go through a learning stage. The garden has to be tilled. And unfortunately, oftentimes the classroom is the classroom of affliction and pain and suffering. It's the classroom that begins to stir the natural questions within you of why God? What is this all about? And there you are. You find yourself in the classroom of being able to learn the basic principles of God. And I'm sorry you've got to go through it. I know it's not easy. I was there a couple weeks ago. And I pray I find myself there over and over again every time I need it. As hard as it is to go through, we need the garden filled. Solid food is for the mature, for those, of who, for those who have their powers of discernment, their powers to judge rightly. That word discernment, it has the word judge in there. Now, there's a lot of debate over, are we judged? Do we judge? Are we not judged? What, what, how, what do we do with judging? But guys, the reality is, you're critiquing me right now as I speak. Your minds are designed to judge. You're, you're hearing my words, and even that statement, you are filtering it through a mind of, is he right? Is he wrong? All right, I mean, so that's clearly not saying we are not to ever make a judgment call. But it's not you who, all, it's not your position to condemn. But we get to a point where we can judge rightly discern rightly it is a power a divine power to do this that you can just on the fly that's of god that's not of god that's righteous that's not righteous that's good that's not good and you're just back and forth and how do you get there well you train yourself through distinguishing good from evil so you ba learn the basic orals, oracles of god we'll list them off here soon you learn the basic doctrines of christ and then you go to work and you practice what you've learned, distinguishing good from evil. And you just, you just start going through life, good, evil, good, evil. But don't, but he's not saying this. Don't call your friend up and say, hey, let's hit McDonald's. I need some practice. You buy me the meal because this is going to be for your good. I'm going to counsel you for free. God says I need to practice constantly distinguishing good from evil in your life is a good life. He's not saying that. The reality is you've got enough in your own life to distinguish good and evil from. So let's start with ourselves. Let's start with working it out in ourselves because I'll tell you what, your thoughts are flying often. I mean, every second, right? Your, your thoughts are back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Is it good? Is it not? Is it evil? Is it not? To start, in fact, you've probably got enough with yourself that you never need to Right? Sharp, so sharpen yourself until you get to the point where you can hit the world and be skilled in the word of righteousness and engage people. He's wordy. I get it. Like I am, right? What, is, what he's getting at is, guys, the mature are those who know how to love like Christ and do it in truth. You know how to love like Christ and you can do it truthfully. 
there's no shade of deceit and there's no condemnation. May you love like Christ and you do it truly. Wait, this is what he's getting at ultimately. That's a hard thing to do when you when you see someone else's life spiraling out of control and there and you see that there's evil at play and you just want to jump all over them, knock it off. It's a very hard thing to do to truthfully love that person. It's an explanation, not an accusation. But learning is constant living. You know, I want to I want to unpack this a little bit more with you. Uh, hopefully in a way that awakens some of you. Um, there's a fight for your mind. There is a fight right now for your mind. If you go back, way back in time, and you just ask what were the basic principles to communicating, it was a face-to-face -face conversation. It was a, uh, hey, just you, you sat down, you talked to someone. There was no digital, there was no technology. There was no way to communicate over any kind of wires or electricity. You just sat and then and talked. And then one day someone saw a crayon and a wall, and they started drawing pictures. And they began to communicate through, through drawings on, in caves on walls. And then that became write, written books. And you quickly fast forward in the printing press scene to open up a new wave of communication where now the common person can have access to books and to information. And that opened up a floodgate. And I want to, before I move on in this, I want you to know that the, the people Hebrews was writing to, why did they become dull in their hearing? Because they were being cast on stakes. They were being burned alive. They were being, for Christ's sake, their kids were being killed and eaten by lions. They were being starved. They were being boiled in, in pots of oil. They were being challenged to their core about their, their, their devotion to Christ. And it made some of them think, I don't know if this is true. You have something much more, I say sinister, because for many of those, as hard as that was, it set them free. But for us today, you can't compare the two. It's two different worlds. The back door has been left open and the road is still open. They've been left open. So the printing press, it, it evolved into, uh, and, I, and I didn't research this, this is just common knowledge, uh, to the uh, telegraph and the telegram, and now Digital communication was starting to get its legs, and, and the, uh, the, the mail system was starting to get some feet on it, but it was reserved for those who had the, the money and the ability and access to a telegram, telegraph, and, and the Pony Express or whatnot, and, and that evolved into uh, Graham Bell making the first telephone, which was not ac accessible to everyone. You had to be rich. You had to have access to it, uh, but that before you knew it, there was a telephone in every home. One telephone in the kitchen or wherever it was. And you could call, you know, Aunt Margaret at any time you wanted and interrupt her life. And when that phone rang, what happened? You became obedient. You answered it. Set down everything you did. Answer that phone. Well, that's not you, right? Because that's Margaret, you know, you know, a hundred years ago. But before long, every house had a phone. Every house had a channel, a line of distraction that was set in it. And then a radio. And then a TV. So then our, our homes, our safe places became places of communication and media where we openly allowed the free flow of information into our lives and at any moment to allow anyone to shut down what we were doing, typically with those we loved, around those we loved, around a piano or around a dinner table. And you were allowed to come into my life at any moment and interject yourself. But that telephone migrated from the kitchen to every bedroom in the house. And that radio migrated to every bedroom in the house. And the TV went to every bedroom in the house. And before long, the phone found its way into the car. That was only reserved for the rich. But we all want to be like the rich. We all have our phones today with us. But the computer came in and, it, and the internet was brought in. And a new form of, of communication ushered into our lives and with the internet, then came email, then came the flow of social media, and now social media, now the 
I think this is the, uh, the dirty, dark little that begins to feel like an accusation, but remains in the realm of an Social media is becoming a multi-billion dollar industry in which it is designed to cause you to be addicted. And the one thing it's caused you to be addicted to is the value, the, re, the receiving of value from one another. It has, it has found its way, it's found its ability to, to access a part of you that is created in the image of God, that is, is, is God's literal stamp the stamp of love, you are created in the image of love, you long to be loved and to love, and social media has found its way into the system, into, inside of you, to begin to lie to you and say, I can fix it. And so we all have our, our, our we, the status updates and the like buttons and the follow buttons that we watch and we track our value online. And that is God. Oh, but the cell phone became a smartphone and it follows us everywhere and then it became a Bluetooth that, that it was stuck in the ear. And watch, just watch, watch what's going on as it migrates closer and closer to the face because we got the watch that now goes off. We, won't, we can leave our phones behind, but we can always, always have a door open, a back door open where the rodents can come in at any moment. You can, you can pull me away from anything I want if I stay here. And now they're working on glasses, glasses that will be fashionable. They've been working on glasses for a long time. They can't make it land. But don't, guys, don't, don't be off guard. They just got to make them look good, and it's got to be functional. And, and what I'm hearing and reading is that these glasses will actually keep it all in front of your face. Here's some averages as of 2019 from Zephora Digital Marketing and Brand Watch. Every minute, this is only Facebook, there are 293,000 Facebook status updates or 421,920,000 per day. Facebook generates four new petabytes, didn't know what that word was until I looked up this morning, of data a day. Four new petabytes of data. Four new petabytes of information that can just flow your way a day. That is 1,024 terabytes or 1 million gigabytes. Four new a day, and it's only evolving to be more and more every day. There are 4 million likes every minute. 4 million likes every minute on Facebook. This is explanation, not accusation. You do what you want. There are 350 million photos uploaded every You've become dull of hearing. It, it's not for me to put together in your life. This is for you and the Lord to do. He does the tilling, but this is only Facebook. It doesn't include Twitter, Instagram, and every other social media you know, business that is trying to get off the ground right now. That's, guys, the powers of darkness. I think what Paul says about moderation applies to this. Just know the back door is open. The rodents are inside. Got to close the back door. I just put this challenge out to you real quick. Um, there's a lot of energy put into social media. I understand a lot of businesses revolve around it. My, my business revolves around it. We, we use it for the church as a great tool. But there's a lot of effort that goes into social media. What if for two weeks you just shut it down? For this series, you shut it down and you spent that energy and you called someone. You got the same value that you're looking for. Or you just call someone and you saw, you saw, hey, they're struggling, and you just, you just, hey, let's go get coffee. Just a suggestion, you do with it what you want, but maybe we should just aim for going back to four. Second Corinthians 10.4 is the battle. The, guys, this is what, what Paul is talking about. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. So why have you become dull of hearing? What has taken place? Why are you struggling in your faith? Why do you feel like God does not care? The weapons of your warfare, they're not of flesh and bone. They're not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. They have the weapons that you fight with have the power of God to, watch his verb, destroy strongholds. 
We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion on Facebook when we see it arise, so we just shoot back and come. No, 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 no. Guys, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge. Not against the knowledge of God. We what? We destroy them. We destroy them. Every argument and all, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. He's not talking about the person next to you. He's talking about your thoughts. He's talking about your opinions. The world does not need to know your opinions. They'll never know it according to the by the way. They need to know what God knows. We need to know what God knows. But these arguments and these opinions, they're raised, they're set up to, uh, to attempt to destroy the knowledge of God in you. The rodents are at work, slowly nibbling at the cables. It's not, but it's not going to work. God's not going to permit it to fully take effect. But you need to destroy every opinion and argument. This is what Hebrews is saying. Your powers of discernment to distinguish good and evil. You have the power of God to begin destroying in your mind these arguments that are set against God. These opinions. I mean, and, and how do you do it? Well, he's get, we're going to get there that we're going to see the basic principles of, of the doctrines of Christ. That will be your filter. You'll take every thought captive. You don't. You'll feel it. You just won't, you won't feel right. I can't stand up here and explain every feeling to you. you God's at work and you just will know something's off. It could be the utter depression in your need to lie to one another, your, your need to, to feel greedy and just more and more money, it's never enough, could just be the simple whisper. Nobody knows. Got to step up. Because there's a great, glorious future right around the corner. And you can be to the You're being, you are ready always to punish every disobedience. Now, what have we learned about obedience? It is learning to live attentive, to, to listen attentively to Christ and respond. So if there's a thought that comes in my mind and, it doesn't, and it's not of Christ and it's not responding to Christ, it needs to be punished by me. And if you have thoughts in your mind that, do not, that are not in obedience to Christ, they are not the love of God, they are not full of joy and hope, they need to be punished. We don't use that word a lot in church. Get it. But in your mind, you need to shut it down. Time to flush these rodents out. Hebrews 6 now, verse 1, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. Now, this is a big statement. I mean, he's saying stop flirting about the first elements of Christ. Move on. Learning is not living. Now, most people will say, this is a good thing. You need to learn about Christ over and over and over again. And he's saying, you've to leave, same word for forgive, divorce. Divorce your, it's a tough say, saying to swallow, but I think he's drawing a hard line here. It's time to move on when the time is ready to move on. You're not the gardener, though. We're explaining not accusing. We're, we're, we're showing you what takes place. Therefore, leave the elementary doctrines of Christ, the first principles of Christ, the, the first elements of Christ, and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. These are the principles. I'm going to breeze through them. I'll highlight them. Go home and watch God work in you. Spend your time in them if you feel like you've fallen away. The foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, simply saying, look, that life, that way you used to think, it doesn't work. You may garnish every, uh, you may garnish, uh, every Facebook follower in this world, and they all may like you, status updates. But if it has no faith, it's worthless. Your, your viral posts are worthless without faith. Repentance is a change of mind. I'm changing the way I think from here on out. That old way of thinking in life, it's over. I'm moving on. I'm trusting God 
in everything. The foundation of, about the instructions about washing, that, that word's baptized, baptism, a lot of symbolism in baptism. If you've been saved, you haven't been baptized. If you know Jesus and haven't been baptized, come talk to me. Because we want to we wanna dunk you in a, in a symbol of you've been crucified with Christ, you've been raised with Christ, you belong in his family, you carry his identity, the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he's forgiven you of all your sins. That word sin can go. You are made pure in the eyes of the Father. You are the righteousness of Christ. It doesn't come and go. You are. But the one who needs this laid again, they, they have a hard time telling themselves, I'm a mess up. You live in guilt and shame. Guilt is not something we live in anymore. It's a tool we use to alert us that we have wandered off the path and we need to come back to faith. The laying on of hands, about this, this author here, he uses words that, they, I mean, you feel like you need to dig into it, but if you just look at the laying on of hands and acts, that each time the Spirit of God moved from that person that laid on the hands to the, the individual that had the hands laid on them, and it represents that you have a new spirit. You have a new life. You have a new power. You, you can begin to conquer the unconquerable in your life because of Christ in you because of his life in you. And, and all you need to do is begin to believe and have faith and trust in all of this. Now, does it mean that tomorrow all the struggles of the world goes away? No, but you begin to see that the gardener's at work. And you begin to see the harvest. You begin to rejoice in the trials instead of blaming God for them, being angry. The resurrection of the dead, a lot of fear and death. I get it, all right? We don't want to die. It's a, it's a fearful thing. Jesus, you know, he, in the garden, he, it was tough. It was tough for him. But he came around, and, and what did he say in the end? Not, he didn't come around. He followed, he followed his father to the end. The fear of death no longer enslaves you. It just becomes a reality we deal with. The resurrection of the dead, the reality is there's a new body waiting out there for you. And it won't be broken. No need for tear ducts unless they're tears of joy. That mole on you that you don't know if you should spend the extra money on to go get looked at won't. I mean, that thought will never cross your mind again. There will be no doctor, no need of a doctor, because the healer is always at hand. There will be no need of healing because the body will be perfectly held together by the life of Christ. The tree of life will be found in a new city. An eternal judgment, right? Does God condemn me or not? No, it says in the Bible, Jesus will sit there and he'll judge us for the deeds we do. Yeah, and I believe I will be judged righteous and any bad deeds will be burned up in the end, but ultimately I will not be condemned by the Father. So I don't need to live in the thought of condemnation today, Romans 5, even while I was an enemy, die for me. No, no condemnation. These are the basic principles. Joyce, I'm so sorry it's so cold in here. Matt said the solution is to just eat more brisket. I want to put the, the, uh, the, the book of Hebrews. It's a very scary book, but hopefully today you kind of see that, uh, that it has a lot of implications for your life. I want to wrap this up. Uh, we, we got a video. Hold off on the video. I want to, we got a video. I'm going to close with some remaining comments and then uh, we'll close in a song but um if you can put the book of hebrews in, into like a thought let's, let's abandon the garden thought for a moment and get to a new thought leave it like a car crash and you're a victim uh you're coming to and there's a rescuer standing over you he's just over and over again it's not your fault stay with me we're gonna we're, we're gonna help you we're gonna save you you're gonna be okay Listen to my voice. This is what the book of Hebrews is getting at. Over and over again, hold on to your confession. Don't let go. If you do, you're going to fade away. Let's watch this video. Just kind of get an idea. It's a little animation we've done in-house of the context of Hebrews, and then I'll close with some final remarks. This is 911. What's your emergency? Yeah, I need to report an accident out here on uh, Old Mill Road, about uh, three miles west of Carson Junction. 
Car's in the water, but there's uh, one person laying here beside the road. Friend, friend, listen. Listen to me. You're going to be okay. The paramedics are on their way. All you need to do right now is focus on my voice. You were in a car accident. It wasn't your fault. You're a bit beat up, but you're going to be okay. Just stay focused on my voice. I will not leave you. I'm here for you. My wife. My wife, my kids. My kids. Friend, friend, listen to me now. It was just you in the car. Your wife and kids are okay. You need to stay focused on my voice. Look at me. Look at me. Stay focused. Trust me, friend. You'll be okay. Stay with me. There is a rescue at work in your life. Yes, that was my voice and Jim's voice. You figured that out. Good job. Your powers of discernment are working just fine right now. There is a rescue at hand. And God is the rescuer. And you need to be rescued. He saw the whole thing. He says it's not your fault. He's here to rescue you. I think that summarizes the statement. This we will do, God permits. If the Lord will allow me to progress my growth, I will. If the rescuer decides to put me on a stretcher, I'm going on a stretcher. If he decides to airlift me out, I'm being airlifted. Got one question for you to entertain the idea of mercy. Does the rescue if does the rescue stop if the victim if the victim cannot keep consciousness and the victim loses sight, does the rescue stop? pray for you. Father God, we thank you that you've come to the rescue. It's hard to say it's not our fault because yes, Father, my sins had a, uh, had a part in nailing your son, your one and only son, the one you loved, treasured the son of man, the son of God to a cross. And yet you say, I have been united to that crucifixion. So therefore, our sins have also nailed us to the same cross. Everywhere we go, we carry his death. We carry his life in these mortal bodies. But it's the life of Christ, the life of your son, Father, that we are longing to grow in. But we give it to you. It's if you permit, you're the gardener, we're the soil. You're growing the new life, which we'll all see Every once in a while, I'll head back to Woodlawn Circle, 1360 Woodlawn Circle for a good cry because it's, uh, you know, it's not a bad thing to go visit your hometown, especially when it's right around the corner. And so I'll drive by my old house and I could see down the side where the garden used to be. Guys, it hasn't been kept in years. But ironically, at least to my eyes, the vegetation growing there is a little different than the rest of the year. Because the garden had its effect, the garden, the work of the tilling had its work even 30 years later. You are a work of God. The soil's being tilled, and when the seed is dropped and the gardener is ready to go to town, it's going to have its effect. You're not. He's with you. We're here with you also.